Right. Welcome to the Institute of World Politics. Today we have an occasion that's at least personal for me, more special than anything I, I can think of. We will remember today one of the greatest American brains, a person who lived by an adage, do what you say that you will do. He was a Christian gentleman. Uh, I will leave in the able hands of my great friend, Dr. Edwards, and uh, Mr. O'Brien to talk about Dr. Kirk's intellectual achievements. I would like you to learn about Dr. Kirk as a human being, not just a brain. He was a, an integrated phenomenon. That is, all those brilliant thoughts came from a formidable, righteous individual. Uh, when I first bumped into his writings, I thought to myself, oh my lord, who is this wasp who understands that Adam Mitzkevich's Pantadeus, please. Sovietized Poles didn't get him, and Russell Kirk did. He understood that this uh, romantic po poem, which is the size of a book called Sir Thaddeus, is really a pian to tradition. He got it. How did he get it? I was very curious. I. Uh, naturally was impressed uh, with his introduction to an array of uh, torchbearers who followed Edmund Burke. I knew all the reactionary monarchists to some big deal, but here was a person wedded to the Anglo-Saxon tradition and thought, preserving a whole army of people who thought like us, evolutionary conservatives. Evolutionary conservatism, unless there is a revolution and war, is much more powerful than the effusions of José de Bonald, José de Maitre, and Donoso Cortés. Even though I know that Russell Kirk's uh, friend and admirer, Eric von Kunnerdlin, would from at this moment. I'm with Dr. Kirk, so I was really intrigued by this person. And when the more I learned about him, the more I understood the correctness of the Marxist theory of unity of the theory and practice. He was, was what he preached. Now, I was trained as a Sovietologist, among other masters, I, I um, uh, learned from um, Robert Conquest, Martin Malia, Adam Ua. He, therefore, I was used to various avatars of the revolution to indulge in a, 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 a bevy of pathologies. And here, I had a conservative who stood in stark contrast to the people who attempted to destroy his world. Lenin had an open marriage. Dzerzhinsky was a voyeur, liked to watch children. Frolic, Menzhinsky's deputy was a sadomasochist. Yagoda had the Soviet Union's greatest collection of sex toys. Yezhov, uh, sometimes, as he wrote in his diary, was a woman and sometimes he was not. Barry, I was a pedophile, and I could go on and on. And here you have the defender of righteousness, who does what he says he would do. Wholesome, not paradise on earth. A person who uh, preserved a method, which was logocentric and empirical, for us to understand how to preserve, defend, 
and change. As the Duke de Lampedusa said, so nothing will change. That was Russell Kirk. He was a was not young, he was a country squire. Uh, I've heard a number of anecdotes about his uh, ancestors. My favorite is, I think an uncle of his was robbed by the machine gun Kelly. Yes, this is the Kirk's claim to fame. They endured. They were not supernovas like Michel Foucault with his apologies. They kept the flame going. Uh, I also remember when he was a student at a college in Michigan that he joined other conservative students in a counter march against communist radicals who, well, went hell mel right in the area. That means in the 1930s, there were plenty of American patriots and conservatives on campuses who could wield their own baseball bats, if needed be. Astonishing. What has happened to the country since the evil 1960s? Dr. Kirk served in the military. That's when he indulged his uh, streak for mobility, lack of hope. He admired Marcus Aurelius. He got over it. Because if you're a Christian, you can't be Marcus Aurelius. It's good to be a retired emperor, <laughs> but Christianity gives you duties. That's what Russell Kirk. So he studied at St. Andrews. I believe he's the only American to have earned the highest distinction, Doctor of Letters. The title is, I'm sure, I'll be standing corrected soon. The highest distinction, and this is what I remember about his PhD uh, experiences. He'd come visit his dissertation advisor. They would chat once a week, and then the dissertation advisor would look at him and say, Who might you be? <laughs> and this is how Dr. Kirk learned on his own. The product of his St. Andrew's adventure was the conservative mind, but it was also much more. He left with Edgar Allan Poe in his pocket, so he knew American ghost story in Scotland. He became absolutely immersed in the morbid Scottish curriculum, gargoyle, goofiness. And I think as far as the volumes translated abroad, he's most famous for his ghost stories, commercially speaking. But that, that is thanks to St. Andrews. Uh, one time, Mrs. Kirk, standing in the kitchen, trying to explain gently what uh, I was facing as far as my relationships. Never got dates in college, but outside of college, there was the beach, so I had relationships. And she said, you know, Mrs. Kirk says, men and women are like this. They complement each other. They're like this. Yes, this was one of the most brilliant explanations of how things should be. Uh, I loved it. So, would you believe me if I told you that Dr. Kirk listened to Annette lecture? That's how they met, <laughs> not the other way around. I mean, she was an ancient of 19. Maybe 18, I don't know, but that's how they met. I remember a chaperoned trip to Europe. Dr. Kirk, I met, and a friend of hers. Dr. Kirk must have been one of the most kind hearted and mellow, thus, oftentimes passive, hence the attraction of Marcus Aurelius, passive observers of life. So after a while, he received a letter 
from a net. Okay, we've coded three years, it's time for you to propose. <laughs> and nothing has been ever the same ever since. He and her joined in a holy matrimony. He also uh, returned to the fold from the Protestant Revolution back to the Apostolic Holy Mother Church. Oh boy, was he in for a surprise. I won't tell you how old Mrs. Kirk is, but let me just put it this way. Pope Paul VI, when asked for a comment about Vatican II, said, oh, I think the smoke of Satan penetrated the altars of St. Peter's. And here was one of the boldest protectors of uh, Christendom, Dr. Russell Kirk, who joined the church at that very moment when the smoke was coming in. He was bold, but it was also because of his wife. Well, a word about Mrs. Kirk's uh, family. She's of French Indian origin. And when anybody would ask Russell Kirk upon visiting them in Piety Hill in the coast of Michigan, so where, is, uh, where are the pictures of uh, your wife's family? Sneer, the salaries are in the kitchen. Because if you go to Mrs. Kirk, I don't know if you have a model, but there is Indian art. Yes. Mel Brooks, not Mel Gibson, <laughs> said he could not write comedy today because of political correctness. Russell Kirk would have none of that. A gentleman and a lady can make jokes and they understand them. This was also the ambience of piety hell. Uh, I'm glad the children are not here, so I won't embarrass them. I'll just tell you one of the daughters attended IWP. But I'll also tell you that Dr. Kirk loved his daughters, and his favorite pastime with them was to brush their hair. Calm their hair. Just say, Am I lying? <laughs> He'd sit there and brush their hair. Uh, the family was just lovely. And so was Piety Hill with his family makes a place. Imagine an old Polish manor house of the nobility of York. That was Piety Hill. Jokes, singing. This was like Mitzkevich's Pantadeusz's manor house. Anybody from that century felt automatically at home at the Kirks. Annette and Russell Kirk practiced an old Polish noble virtue called the economy of the heart. That translates into taking all the strays and oh boy, hobos? My favorite story is they took in a guy Toothless guy who became their butler and burnt their house down. <laughs> he forgot to close the door and extinguish the fire. I guess once living out in the open, one wouldn't have to worry about stuff like that. So he just burned their house down. <laughs> Pregnant girls, you're in trouble? Mrs. Kirk would take him in. Would Dr. Kirk notice? No, well, it's so much as to say hello to a new face. And this is the essence of Piety Hill. There was even a Polish refugee who's now a professor at, I think, Catholic University. He showed up with the whole family and just stayed. Showed up and announced, and it was me. Me, me, um, uh, the in and out comic relief of the Kirk family. Uh, a facilitator of all sorts of things. Dr. Kirk 
and his family practice their faith. Not in any ostentatious manner. Just the way a lady, a gentleman, and the kids would do. I remember they even salvaged bits and pieces from their old village church. And the church was executed by a kumbaya bishop and a father fluffy who thought he was a sister down the line. They leveled an old church to build a barrack. One of the most offensive sites because you go through the countryside of Mich Michigan which lifts up your heart and then you enter Mecosta and you say, what, what the heck is the church? Instead, a hangar. I don't know. But the church, but the, the crooks saved it and it's in their house chapel, unless you didn't want it. The relationship of the economy of the heart and faith never ends. Untold hundreds of young people and others have traveled to Mecosta to briefly stand before a magisterium that is intellectually second to none in the United States of America. Private sanctuary. And then some, especially those who follow up and the needy ones, some of them they attract now Mrs. Kirk's attention, who continues to run the ship. Dr. Kirk was just wandering from one boat to another when he was with us. And Mrs. Kirk snaps her fingers and performs miracles. Here's an example. A gentle giant, one of my younger friends, huge guy, linebacker, from Whittier College. If you saw him, you'd give up on him. That's how big he is. Uh, came and learned from Dr. Kirk, and Mrs. Kirk. And then Mrs. Kirk hooked him up at Oxford. He remodeled C.S. Lewis's house while studying. That's how he put himself to Oxford. Not to mention, he was dispatched with a blessing to visit all sorts of reactionary dinosaurs in Europe. A side story, because Dr. Kirk was a planet and affiliated with other gigantic planets. You all know about Bill Buckley, but here is a, another one. Eric von Kunertledin, another dinosaur. It's the fellow who one time approached Andrea, you see? Yeah, and a, you know, Mrs. Kirk's daughter at the party and said, Young lady, this is how he introduced himself. Are you married? No. Well, a lady your age should be either married or a nun. <laughs> so, Brian Brown, the evangelical kid from Orange County, ran out of money. In Europe, and he had a backup plan to contact the dinosaurs. And since he was in Austria, the phone call went to Eric von Kunetledi, who asked him, Young man, are you a Catholic? And Brian says, No, I'm a Protestant. The less you protest, the more you become like us Catholics. Call yourself evangelical. And this was also a car connection. That would not have happened without piety Hill. Brian, with fear, watched his money disappear into the paper. And then Eric von Kunet Ledinson, the chauffeur, picked him up and kept him at his place until Brian could get some money from home. This is a network that permeated the media which Russell Kirk upkept in the United States. The economy of the heart should be the rule. The cash nexus is, and Marxism, lesbianism, 
he stood against that in the most gentle, cultivated way. Dr. Kirk conserved not only the material, he preserved the continuity of first things, the continuity of tradition. Indeed, his was the theory of the unity of theory and uh, practice in action, in not a small part thanks to Mrs. Kirk. Thank you very much. Go back. <laughs> we have two distinguished panelists who we'll talk about serious things, not personal things. Matthew O'Brien currently serves as director of research at the Federation of American Immigration Reforms. Uh, over the past 20 years, he has held a wide variety of positions focusing on immigration issues both in government and the private sector. Prior to joining the fair, Matt served as the chief of the National Security Division within the Fraud Detection and National Security Di uh, Director of the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, where he was responsible for formulating implementing procedures uh, to protect the legal immigration system from terrorists, foreign intelligence operators, and, the and other national security threats. He has uh, also held positions as the chief of the FDNS Policy and Program Development Unit, as the chief of the FDNS EP5 Division, as assistant chief counsel with U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, a senior advisor to the Citizenship and Immigration Services Ombudsman, and as a uh, district adjudication officer with the Legacy Immigration and naturaliz Naturalization Service. In addition, Matt has extensive experience as a part of the bar. He holds a Bachelor's of Arts in French from the Johns Hopkins University and a Juris Doctor from the University of Maine School of Law. And he's currently a student at the Institute of World Politics. That's how we know each other. His uh, concentration is national security affairs. I would like to invite Mr. O'Brien to JD to Reflect on Russell Clicks. I did not know Dr. Kirk. I, I never had the opportunity to meet him. Um, but it is interesting. He was, uh, and he mentions this throughout his writings, a, a big uh, fan of Edmund Burke's belief that we all participate in a community of souls and that generations are connected across the ages that we share in cumulative experience mm -hmm. that helps us define how we should live our lives. So I suppose in that sense, having become familiar with his works, I know him at least in, in one aspect. Um, and I want to address one of the less frequently studied aspects of Dr. Kirk's work, uh, and that's his conception of the common law and its role as one of the roots of American order and, and the current crisis that the common law is experiencing. There's an unfortunate gulf in the United States between scholars of politics and history and scholars of the law. Um, it's a gulf that's not effectively bridged very often, but it's very important to understanding our system and how it works. Um, it's much more common, despite a lot of uh, some of the other complaints that can be made about Europe, and particularly in this day and age, um, law and political science and the, the study of how legislation becomes jurisprudence are really one thing that are studied together. And, and it's very rare in American literature about the law and about politics to find a scholar, whether a lawyer or from another discipline, who is actually able to bridge that gulf and, and speak knowledgeably about the role that the law plays in, in the overall way that we live our lives here in the United States. And uh, in my experience, in 20 years as a practicing lawyer, I think Dr. Kirk is the rare scholar who actually effectively bridged that gap and explained in very clear, succinct, and lucid terms what the common law is, why it is important, and 
and how it is one of the, the key factors in the American system and its durability. Um, the common law refers both to the system that we use in the United States uh, and, and in other Commonwealth countries, uh, where the framework for interpreting and applying the law uses decisions, prior decisions from courts, as a guideline to how the law should be applied, which is, establishes a link with past generations and with the ways that society has formed of doing things over time. And the Kirkian concept of the law uh, is summarized in the Roots of American Order, and it's summarized in a remarkable way. I wish that I had read the Roots of American Order while I was in law school because Dr. Kirk reduces to 10 points, one of the most complicated legal systems in the world, and in those 10 points, not only explains the system, but explains why it works so effectively. Uh, and I'm gonna paraphrase from the Roots of American Order. The law, which is no respecter of persons, stands supreme. The king himself is under the law, and the law is not a creation of the sovereign, but the source of his power. And in those two points lies the fundament of the Anglo-American notions of both natural law and political freedom. Now, should the sovereign break the law, his subjects would be absolved from their allegiance to him and no longer obligated to obey the law. Stable government itself grows out of law, not law out of government. For a body of law to be truly enforceable, it must receive the willing assent of the mass of people living under such a law. And if the political power decrees positive laws without reference to general consent, those laws will be evaded or defied, and respect for the law will diminish, so the force must be substituted for justice. Uh, the British people, and later the American people, who derive their culture from their British forebears, view the common law as their own, rather than something that was imposed upon them from above and which they were forced to live by. As such, they were generally willing to obey the law, or at least observe the proper forms for changing it when they became dissatisfied with various aspects of the law. At heart, the law is the expression of natural justice and the ancient ways of the people. And the common law, more so than any other legal system, carries forward the received wisdom of centuries of doing things that are essential to the functioning of a free society. Now, in 10 remarkably concise points, that is the essence of the philosophy behind the common law, which is something that is unique to the, the Anglo-American experience and to the countries that, that share their cultural <laughs> heritage with Britain. And the law acts as a break on the sovereign, but it also shields the individual from the concentrated power of the state. It preserves the property rights that are the foundation of both civic freedom and the free market. And perhaps most importantly, the law serves as the lubricant that allows all of Burke's essential little platoons to go about all the little tasks that make life in a free society good and productive. Ultimately, the fundamental purpose of the law is to keep the peace. And if you think in terms of the, the international relations term and, and just war doctrine of the tranquillitas ordinis, it has an analog which is the harmonious functioning of competing interests within states and keeping the peace. If you're not at peace internally, you really can't be at peace with your neighbors. Um, Dr. Kirk wrote an article that appeared in the April 1983 edition of Imprimus uh, entitled, We Cannot Separate Christian Morals and the Rule of Law. And it was particularly interesting because back in 1983, it essentially summarizes the crisis that we're currently experiencing in terms of the law. We now have a concept of the law as something that's totally secular and that is divorced from our morality, and we are attempting to address some of the most complex and, and quite frankly, penetrating questions that we've encountered over the last century. Things about immigration and how do we preserve our culture in the face of it, uh, how do we deal with terrorism, particularly when it comes from a religiously motivated adversary, and still preserve our concepts of freedom of religion. And there were a couple of interesting quotes in that article. Dr. Kirk said, when this end, the law is the keeper of the peace, is forgotten, and instead the law is used by some as a means of extortion from others, or as an instrument for class advantage, or as a tool for social direction, or merely the gratifying of malice, why the law itself tumbles into injustice. 
And I, I think most of us can think of situations that we've read about in the news recently where the law really seems to have become a tool for enforcing a, a specific political agenda rather than for maintaining peace and maintaining the functionality of society. I also said that true law necessarily is rooted in ethical assumptions or norms, and those moral principles are derived, in the beginning at least, from religious convictions, when the religious understanding from which a concept of law arose in a culture has been discarded or denied, while the laws may endure for some decades through what sociologists call cultural lag, but in the long run, the laws will also be discarded or denied after having been severed from their ethical and religious sources. And that's exactly what's happening in the United States today. The United States is probably unique in the sense that the Founding Fathers succeeded in bringing to bear the morality of the Judeo-Christian system, but divorced from any particular notion of religious membership. And the courts in the United States in their early years were essential in maintaining that balance. One was free to be whatever religion one wanted to be in the United States, but the expectation is that our community standards were based on the Judeo-Christian tradition, and those would serve as the fundamental underlying moral basis for how we applied our laws. Now, Dr. Kirk also said certain moral postulates of Christian teaching have been taken for granted in the past as the ground of justice. When courts of law ignore those postulates, we grope into judicial darkness. And unfortunately, we seem to be groping in the judicial darkness. And why are we in that position? Well, it's because the common law represents a crude legal wisdom. It's everything that Dr. Kirk discussed in Edmund Burke's philosophy in The Conservative Mind. It's one of the primary ways that we reach back in the community of souls and communicate with past generations. And what the common law process is supposed to do is connect us to wise decisions made by wise educated men and women in the past and applied to common social problems. The bulk of the law, we tend to think of it in the United States as something that involves criminal cases. But the fact is that the vast majority of the work of courts goes on in the civil realm, but it has to do with things like private property and contracts and all of the things that make society function in its little details. And what it is, is it's an alternative to simply going out and clubbing each other to settle disputes or, or settling them by trial uh, the way that they were physical trial in the Middle Ages. Now, the common law in that respect, rather than being a revolutionary entity, it, it should act in the same manner of a parachute. And it should provide gentle resistance that keeps us from crashing when we make ill-advised leaps into the void. And it does this as I said, by relying on the judgment of learned men and women whose very training should connect them via their knowledge of precedent and via their knowledge of the philosophy of the law to the accumulated wisdom that comes from sources like Blackston, Cook, Marshall, Rehnquist, and others whose decisions have laid out a blueprint for an ordered approach to resolving society's most challenging dilemmas. Uh, Dr. Kirk in The Roots of American Order quoted Alexis de Tocqueville, who referred to an aristocracy of lawyers and judges, <laughs> saying, An American judge armed with the right to declare laws unconstitutional is constantly intervening in political affairs. He cannot compel the people to make the laws, but at least he can constrain them to be faithful to their own laws and remain in harmony with themselves. There's a problem, though. We have now produced several generations of Benthamite jurists who have been raised on things like the writings of John Rawls, and they have an alarming set of beliefs about the law. They see the law as utilitarian and meant only to serve those ends presently valued by the majority or the governing apparatus. They see the law as devoid of any external moral force rather than turning to the Judeo-Christian concept of morality as a lone star. They believe that all law is positive law. And positive law refers to law that is binding only if it's implemented by a government with perceived legitimacy. And that makes the law something entirely separate from what T.S. Eliot called the permanent things and what Hadleyarchus referred to as first principles. And this has created a legal environment in which it has become far too easy for judges to view themselves as a super legislature, a societal and cultural elite, who are charged with righting wrongs rather than interpreting and applying the law within an established framework. 
This means that much of the judiciary has abandoned its role as the guardian of an internally coherent, philosophically consistent system of laws. And the inevitable result is the belief that rather than being bound by enduring principles that stretch backward through Cook and Blackston to Hooker and Aquinas and Augustine and even further back to the Roman and Greek philosophers, they actually hold the power to implement the progressive vision of a perfectible humanity. Uh, Dr. Mike Adams, who uh, usually writes satirical commentary on Town Hall, uh, had a piece recently where he was actually addressing some serious issues about uh, the current struggle over abortion. And he had a great quote. He said, in the final analysis, the man who uses postmodernism for a moral compass eventually becomes a law unto himself. The compass points back at him regardless of where he is, and that is why he is always lost. And we now have several generations of people sitting on the bench and appearing in court to represent people who have absolutely no idea of the underlying theory of the law. They're simply there to argue, and they're looking for the judges to behave as referees. And the judges have seemed all too willing to do that. And so you see these bizarre results where, with the so-called Trump travel ban, you had an action that was specifically authorized by statute and has been for well over 50 years. And you have the ACLU and the Southern Poverty Law Center and all these other similar organizations sued to block the president from taking that action, which was not only clearly authorized by Congress, it's immune from judicial review under a doctrine called the Plenary Powers Doctrine. If you look at the Obamacare case that went to court, you had a penalty that was clearly defined in the statute itself as a penalty divided, uh, redefined by the Supreme Court as a tax so that the legislation could be left in place and would survive a constitutional challenge. Um, there are nearly endless attacks on the Second Amendment, and we now see the forces of the left co-opting our children, who not only cannot lawfully purchase a weapon, in most cases can't drive and can't vote, but co-opting them is the new experts. And it's eerily reminiscent of the, the Marxist and Leninist <laughs> approach of trying to draw in the children as the vanguard of the revolution. And the Hitler Youth. And the Hitler Youth and the Communist Pioneers and uh, in Cuba. Um, we also see the constant erosion of religious principles as the basis for any kind of societal standards. And I mean that beyond the law. Uh, Dr. Hodakevich referenced being a Christian gentleman. That was something that, that my father and my grandfather regularly talked to me about. And uh, you know, on those occasions when I was small and would misbehave, they would say, you're not behaving like a Christian gentleman. I don't think there are many men who are, are brought up that way anymore, unfortunately. Um, and I think that's important because it is one of the things that helps preserve civility in society. Um, you know, in a bygone age, people bumped into each other in the subway, and rather than beating each other to death and then going and listening to rap music, they apologized and they moved along. And that is sort of the lubricant that avoids all of the little conflicts that can blow up in a society and undermine the society. But now for the good news. The little platoons are active. And I think during the last election, what we saw was the little platoons becoming activated. I think that uh, the election that led to President Obama taking the White House twice uh, was a reaction to the sort of modernist notion that the United States is a racist place and we could cure this by electing a president not on the basis of his abilities, or to quote Martin Luther King, not on the content of his character, but rather on the color of his skin, uh, which is not a wise way to choose a president. Now, we probably have made an equally unwise choice this time around um, because we elected someone based on his not possessing the qualities of the prior Chief of uh, <laughs> Chief Executive and Head of State, uh, rather than the actual qualities that he possesses. So the war is far from won, but we have seen a resurgent conservative movement based in a large part on the ideals of Dr. Kirk, and it has begun the process of retaking our republic. I was at CPAC this year. It was astounding. There were a large number of highly motivated people. And what I thought was particularly interesting is you saw a large number of people excited to be there when they had a, a just one of the lousiest slates of speakers that I've ever seen at CPAC <laughs> over the last few decades. And yet people were still excited to come together and discuss the kind of things that Dr. Kirk brought into the culture and summarized so neatly. Um, so we may be stuck with a flamboyant and flawed candidate for chief executive, but 
the little platoons made their power felt. They said, we're not going to, under, to stand, nor are we going to, to continue to put up with the kind of complete disrespect for the law and for the Constitution that we saw over the previous eight years. And now we see a chief executive who, in many ways, is attempting to sort of restore the rule of law to our immigration system and restore the balance between the three branches of government. And he's being challenged at every point, but he's also being backed up by large numbers of the little platoons throughout society. So I think probably the best thing that we can hope for is going forward, the people becoming active will revisit the works of Dr. Kirk and many of his contemporaries in the conservative movement and begin doing what he always cautioned, which to, to borrow the 80s phrase from the movie is looking back to the future and connecting through the community of souls to make sure that we are being true to our American roots while also acknowledging that times change, that the people who wrote the Constitution didn't have things like the internet or what's casually labeled assault weapons, but that really doesn't matter because it was based on the permanent things and the first principles. Uh, we also need to acknowledge the fact that the whole notion of progressivism, at least as it relates to the law and the Constitution, is problematic because if your Constitution is a living document, then you don't really need a Constitution. The Constitution is designed to be permanent and give you a compass. And so I think while things have been frustrating, the news is good and the little platoons are prevailing. Thank you. We'll just stand up, be out of the camera, to introduce my star. Uh, I've known him and admired him for a long time, in particular as former roommate of our late Professor Herb Romerstein, America's leading red hunter. And this was Herb Romerstein's wingman. I uh, worship uh, Lee Edwards for his work in the Victims of Communism Foundation. Remember the MIA flags? You're not forgotten? That's the Edwards about all victims of communism. Not just the MIAs from the US military. Everybody is not forgotten. And it's in this town, it's largely because of Dr. Edwards, who is also our professor. Never likes to come here to teach, but he's listed as our professor, so he's here in spirit. The Victims of Communism Foundation used to be located here for many years. Uh, Dr. Edwards is um, a senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation, but you all know that, that's official. He's a formidable American historian, in particular as far as uh, conservatism. He's written and edited and co-edited about 25 books. He also has taught at uh, the Catholic University of America, no? Yeah. He still runs the Victims of Communism Foundation. I highly recommend his biographies of Ronald Reagan, Barry Goldwater, The Buckley, Ed Meese, and plenty of others. He said I'm translated into Chinese, Japanese, French, Hungarian and Swedish. Well, I have to but do something Polish. about Well, <laughs> thank you for rubbing it in. Dr. Kirk's work has been translated into Polish. Baby steps. Remember, our resources are limited. Donate to the UCD the World Politics. We'll get a book out in Polish. It has to, it actually has to be. Uh, I think Dr. Edwards is working on a brief history of the Cold War. Have you finished it? Yes. 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 So is it out? It's out. Okay. So we have a brief history of, uh, of the Cold War. He's done so many things that, that we should just have a panel devoted to the things he's done. <laughs> and I can only mention a few. This is, he was the founding director of the Institute of Political Journalism at Georgetown University and a fellow of the Institute of Politics at, JF, uh, at the JFK School of Government at Harvard. He used to be 
an underling of Julie Flick, which means he was the president of Philadelphia Society. <laughs> Julie is the power behind the throne. She runs everything. Philadelphia Society. And the media fellow at the Hoover Institution. So all the good places. And he gets around. He's on TV quite frequently. And not only Fox News, also Bloomberg, <laughs> CNN, NBC, PBS, C-SPAN, and NPR. Well, <laughs> go and proselytize among the pagans. His work has been published in the Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe, LA Times, National Review, Human Events, Claremont Review of Books, The American Spectator, and we should have another panel just to list how many uh, media outfits have been honored with the NYT's writings. He's been awarded the Order of Merit of the Republic of Hungary, the Millennium Star of Lithuania, the Cross of Terra Mariana of Estonia, the Friendship Medal of Diplomacy from the Republic of China, Taiwan. The joint. Uh, I'm sorry? The good China. Well, oh, I'm sorry, the only China. Anything that becomes communist is no longer continuity, so it cannot be Chinese. Wherever there are communists, they pride themselves of cutting off the links of tradition. Therefore, they prefer to produce a new being, Homo Sovieticus, not to continue with humanity as we know it. The Reed Irvine Media, an accuracy award legend of Yaf, oh yes, I hope you will sing some Yaffer songs one day for us. Young America's Foundation, the Walter John Freedom Award. Uh, his doctorate is from uh, Catholic University. And then he has a Doctor of Humane Letters degree from Grove City College. I'm sure he is the one who cracked the whip over the head of Paul Kanger, who's been producing, and in fact, I know that's, that's the truth, who's been producing volumes on things conservative. His BA is from Duke University. I hope you're impressed. I see your floor, because you're still sitting. And I'd like to turn the floor over to Dr. Edwards. Well, Russell Kirk was, uh, was many things, as we've heard here, an historian, uh, someone who is a fantastic lecturer, wrote many, many books, 20, 25 books, 30 books, was a novelist uh, as well, wrote some classic Gothic tales, which are well worth reading. But I think above all, he had an enormous heart and sympathy. He didn't really like to talk about politics. And so a few years ago, when he was still with us, his family and our family were having dinner together outside at the Tabard Inn here in Washington, D.C. And my wife, Anne, and Ned, uh, babbling away about politics. <clears throat> also, uh, our older daughter who loved politics, Elizabeth, leaving our Catherine, who was the younger daughter, sort of isolated. And she was sitting next to Russell. And Catherine is totally oblivious to politics, is bored to death by politics, government. And Russell could see that. And he sort of leaned over to Catherine midst of all of this impassioned discussion of the latest in Washington, D.C., and say, do you believe in ghost stories? <laughs> and Catherine said, well, I know there's the Holy Ghost. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, let me tell you about a ghost in my room. And he proceeded to tell a ghost story and entrance Catherine and bring her in, into a feeling of here is somebody who really cared about me and so forth that 
he so cared and was so concerned about the other person and not himself. He was, he called himself a man of letters. But I think it's more accurate to call him a master of letters. Because he could write anything, he did write everything, and about a thousand different topics and all the bells we've heard already here. And we just to talk about two contributions that he made. Number one, he gave the conservative movement its name. We had no name uh, in the early 1950s. How do we know? Well, in 1951, Bill Buckley wrote a very famous book of his, his first book, uh, God and Man at Yale. And he, in that book, uh, after excoriating Yale for abandoning God and teaching socialism and not capitalism, he said, I want to say that I am an individualist. He did not call himself a conservative. As a matter of fact, he said, I am not, I am not a conservative. I'm an individualist. That was 1951. In 1953, Russell Kerr published his, his masterpiece, his uh, magisterial, The Conservative Mind. Obviously, The Conservative Mind. Uh, and it was not only well received, it was well praised by everybody, left and right, uh, and became a, a, a seminal work in 1953. In 1955, Bill Buckley founded National Review, in which he said, this is what? An individualist journal? No, no. This is a conservative journal. And I am what? An individualist? No, I am a conservative. I'm convinced of anything in, in my entire life that the reason why Bill Buckley went to the trouble of saying conservative journal, I am a conservative over and over and over and over again, is because of Russell Kirk's extraordinary work, The Conservative Mind. Now, we know one of the things, we know that Bill Buckley was so desirous, so, so on fire to get Russell to join the magazine, that he came out to Macosta, Buckley did, sat down with, with Russell Kirk and for six hours tried to, to get him uh, to, to come on board with the masthead. Now they were doing this conversation not in the library but at a local pub where they were consuming Tom Collins. <laughs> now, I don't know how many of you have drunk Tom Collins or not but as I recall it's basically gin mostly gin and everything else that they could possibly come up with. So Russell was a pretty fair imbiber, and so was, uh, so was Bill, but Bill was top that night. So about midnight, somewhat bleary-eyed, Bill looked one more time and said, Russell, will you? Russell said, well, I will not join your masthead, but I promise I will write a column for you about higher education. And so he did for the next 25 years. That's how important Russell Kirk was to National Review and Bill Buckley at the founding of it. Russell Kirk gave us, God bless him, our name. Because if it were not for he, for him, we would be called, I'd have to say that I'm a member of the individualist movement. <laughs> and that does not flow easily off your tongue. So we're grateful to him. There are so many things that Russell contributed to the conservative canon. So many. Let me just mention one. And if you have not read it, and reference was made to the roots of American order, Russell said, well, if you want to know where we get American order, what he called the order of liberty, you must look at five cities. And he went all the way back, and he began with uh, Jerusalem, and saying that out of Jerusalem, that city, the idea of, of a being, a supreme being, 
uh, and the idea of moral order. Then if you look at Athens and the idea of a political order and the importance of philosophy, and then look at Rome and the idea of a Senate which is uh, elected by the people, and which is independent of the, uh, of the ruler, and then go to London, the mother of parliaments, and leading up to that, you had the medieval ideas of valor and honor and chivalry, and then finally culminating in Philadelphia, where was born the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. So using this device of the five cities and bringing it all together, it just it just struck this marvelous chord in, in my own mind. And I, I said to, to, to Russell once, I said, oh, it's such a brilliant idea that you thought of these five cities. And he said, oh, I thought it was sort of obvious. So, <laughs> so what was obvious uh, to him was not obvious to the rest of us. In the last chapter of his last book, he asked the question, is life worth living? Is it worth living? And he said, well, we live in a quite chaotic world. And many might shrug their shoulders and dismiss such a fundamental question. But Russell provides a conservative alternative, writing that life ought to be lived with what? With honor, with charity, and with prudence. Some people might call those the uh, permanent things. He loved to quote Orestes Bronson, so I'm going to finish with Orestes Bronson. Who was Orestes Bronson? 19th century author, a Catholic convert, just like Russell, and a favorite, as I say, of Russell's. Well, way back in the 19th century, uh, Orestes Bronson was invited to Dartmouth College at graduation speech, and this is what he said. Ask not what your age wants, but what it needs, not what it will reward, but what without which it cannot be saved, and that go and do. It was something that he liked to use in talking particularly to, to young people, what he called the rising generation. And it just strikes me those are words by which to lead and live then and now. A remarkable man, Russell Kirk, not just a man of letters, but a master of letters, somebody who touched so many minds, but also hearts. Merrick talked about the economy of the heart, that he was interested in the heart, interested in the mind, but also interested in the spirit. Uh, to paraphrase the Polish anthem, Russell Kirk shall live so long as we are alive. Mm. This Russell Kirk is now what he always liked to be, a ghost, a spirit, an idea. <laughs> but it permeates me and he'll be in me until I'm dead, along with lots of dinosaurs of mine who are gone. Uh, and I hope that what he has or he had to offer is permanent for it recognizes the permanence of the human condition that means should our descendants meet in a thousand years they will be able, able to relate to Russell Kirk not to Michel Foucault <laughs> that's how it should be Thank you. Thank you very much.